Well, good morning. I trust you're doing well this morning. It's the first day of March, which is, of course, the first day of autumn. And um, a little bit overcast. Quite an appropriate first day of beginning to cool down a little bit. Of course, we haven't had a whole lot of hot weather during summer, but it's good to be able to be here with you. We've been talking about what it means to love one another as a part of our three core intent statements, love Jesus, love one another, and love our city. And we focused in on Sunday on what it says in 1 John chapter 4 about loving one another. And we looked at the five main things, the, the singular cause of love, who is God, of course, the sacrificial character of love. He sent his son to die for us and, and therefore showed us what love actually looks like. The supernatural consistency of love, how we are to abide in him and he abides in us and matures and perfects that love in us. The sure confidence that we can have through the love that God gives us so that we can stand before him in the day of judgment and know that we are accepted in him and our his love has been perfected in us and then he finishes off with the sovereign command to love love one another and if you don't love then you don't know god kind of thing so it's been interesting uh, an interesting week i was have been looking at some various things going on in the world and and potentially I guess I could say the world of, of religion. And it's fascinating to me that there was a group that, um, and, and I don't need to call names or anything else, but a group that used this passage to justify sinful behavior and to justify their blessing of sinful behavior. And they used this passage, First uh, John 4, where it says, if anyone does not love, he does not know God because God is love. And of course, the definition of love there was sinful activity that God has clearly said in Scripture is sin. And it caused me to begin thinking about how we look at these words and and definitions are so important because when God says, love one another, he is saying it in consistency with his character. He's not saying it to say, ignore truth and ignore what he has said love is. But he's saying you need to love in the way that I love. And since love originated with him, since he is the very essence of love, then we have to understand his definition of love, both for him and for each other. Let me read the verses again from 7 through 10. And we'll talk a little bit about them this morning, expand them a little bit more. There's so much in this passage that we could, we could talk for weeks about it. But let's just talk for a moment about these first four verses. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So as we said, the, the cause of love or the origin of love is, is God. So we don't get to then take that and define it however we want. We, we listen and learn and grow in the definition that God has given us of what that love is. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Several things there that I think we have to think about and unpack a little bit because 
if we are looking to find a definition of what God means by loving one another, does he mean that no matter what you do, as long as you are loving another person, loving each other, and we often put our own spin and, and our own definition, our own value on that, and we even try to justify sinful activity by saying, yes, but, but they love each other. And he is saying here, if you don't love each other in the way that I have said you should, then you don't know God because God is love. And if you want to know what that love looks like, in fact, he says it in this the love of God was manifest among us. It was shown to us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So why did God send Jesus into the world? He sent him into the world, and he goes on and says, to be the propitiation for our sin, the payment for our sin, the uh, appeasing a holy God. So right away we know that God is not saying love wipes out all standards and rules and it, it levels the playing field so that there is no right or wrong. In fact, the very fact that Jesus had to come and die means that there is sin, that there is wrong, a wrong kind of, of love and activity. And it's amazing, isn't it? Because when you look at the characteristics of God, when you look at the, the attributes of God, you have to be reminded sometimes that God's attributes are fully and totally consistent with one another. There's no division. There's no um, contradiction in those attributes and in those characteristics that he has. And so love will never contradict the other aspects of God that we know. And so when we talk about this love, this, and what John means here when he's saying love one another, and if you don't love, you don't know God, because God is love, what is the love he's talking about? Is it just a common love between anyone with any kind of activity engaged in, in that? Is this love to be expressed in a sinful way? Well, the answer to that question, of course, is no. It's not just any love. In fact, God's love, and this is the love we're talking about, because as we mentioned, as it says to us in the, in the book of Romans chapter 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The whole nature and character of that is that this love is God's love. It's not just any love. It's not just whatever we think it ought to be. It's not just based upon our feelings. And let's be honest, human beings have gotten it wrong since the beginning of time. We have listened to the enemy, the one that seeks to pervert God's truth, pervert God's love, to cause us to think wrong is right and right is wrong. And in all of that, we have been steered in a direction that says, as long as two people love each other, it doesn't matter what they do. And God is saying, no, no, my love is consistent with my character. 
So I want to point out three things that just just three this morning about this love. First of all, it's a it's a pure love. God's love is always going to be consistent with his holy character. So it's not sinful. It's not lustful. It's not only focused on pleasure. It's a pure love. So to try to justify sinful behavior by saying, yes, but, but we're in love is a misunderstanding of the love of God. In fact, true, actual true love is willing to confront sin and evil. So it's a pure love. Secondly, and we've already mentioned this, this is one of the things we talked about on Sunday, it's a sacrificial love. It's not self-centered. It's not envious of others. It's not, well, you use a popular word that's going around today. It's not narcissistic. It, it doesn't just focus in on me and what I want and, and my pleasure. It is sacrificing. And in, in describing this love, John said, let me help you understand God's love. He said, in this is love, not that we love God. It's not about what we do, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. You see, that in itself defines the kind of love that God's talking about here because he recognizes that his righteous wrath on sin had to be satisfied. It had to be appeased. And so Jesus was sent to die in our place so that that sin could be atoned for. And so to somehow say and justify sin on the basis of love is a total aberration of what God has actually done. God said, I love you so much that I'm willing to give my son to, to take care of and appease my wrath. Because I'm a holy God, my wrath is going to fall on sin. That's, that is who I am, my nature. And, but my love also is going to, to fall on you by me sending my son to be the propitiation for that sin. That's true love. Love that's not going to turn away from the hard things in order to be experienced. That brings us to the third thing, and that is that love is a truthful, this love is a truthful love. So it's a pure love, it's a sacrificial love, it's a truthful love. It's based on the truth of God and the truth about God. And, and God has said in his word that love and truth exist in a perfect balance together. It's amazing, isn't it, how often the things of God and even things in the Bible are used to, they, they turn them, they twist them and seek to try to justify activity and behavior that our flesh desires to do. Let me read you a quote from, uh, I, I've told you that we've been doing devo a devotional book by D Paul David Tripp that I would highly recommend. Um, New Morning Mercies, it's, it's called. And um, he has some very insightful things that he says, listen to this, real 
biblical, self-sacrificing, God-honoring love never compromises what God says is right and true. Truth and love are inextricably bound together. Love that compromises truth simply isn't love. Truth without love ceases to be truth because it gets bent and twisted by other human agendas. I just, that, that's just a stunning statement. He goes on and says, Now I'm not talking about being self-righteous, judgmental, critical, and condemning. No, I'm talking about choosing not to ignore wrong, but dealing with wrong with the same grace that you have been given by God. Grace, listen to this statement, grace never calls wrong right. If wrong were right, grace wouldn't be necessary. If sin weren't evil and wrong, Jesus would have never had to come. The cross of Jesus Christ is the only model you need of what love does in the face of wrong. Love doesn't call wrong right. Love doesn't ignore wrong and hope it goes away. Love doesn't turn its back on you because you were wrong. Love doesn't mock you. Love doesn't mean I turn the tables and work to make you hurt in the same way you have hurt me. Love gives itself up in your place. That's the kind of love that John is describing here in this passage. It's a pure love. It's a sacrificing love. It's a love that's truthful. As we think about loving one another today, let's remember that we need to be talking about the same kind of love, a love that is truth and love together, a love that does not compromise the character of God in any way. Anything else is not true love. I trust that's helpful for you today, and I trust that you will be challenged and encouraged to love in the way that God wants us to love. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this amazing love that you've given us. It's such a powerful thing to know that you are love and that you have demonstrated what that love looks like so clearly through the gift of your Son. May we not turn our face away from a love that makes that sacrifice the number one thing in our lives that we need to, to look to to understand what love is. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your goodness and your mercy and your love shown to us through your Son, Jesus. May we now go and love one another today. Bless and guide us through the rest of our day and the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining this morning. We're continuing our series and talking about loving our city this week. And we have a very special guest, some missionaries that we have supported for many, many years, Gary and Faith Mackay, and they're coming to share with us during our service on Sunday. Please be there and you'll be blessed and challenged, I know, greatly. Uh, by hearing what they have to bring to us. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And remember, I love you.